The uh, second text of the morning worship comes from the very, very tail end of the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, and it's known as the Great Commission passage, where Jesus says, initially, all authority is mine, therefore, so under his authority, with his powerful authority, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hallelujah. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness, 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 have we received grace, grace, grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we started out looking at uh, highlights of the Bible, and then we said, well, what about the Bible itself? Do Presbyterians believe anything particular about it? And we found it uh, a little bit, but not so much. All of the distinctive Presbyterian beliefs are shared by many, many others. And it's just really an accent point here or there. And we went on to say, well, is that true with the church? What do we believe about the church? We talked about the Bible, but the Bible is used in the church. And so we talked about that. And now I want to keep on this is what, what do we practice in the church? How do we get into the church? Well, the answer is baptism. And is there anything peculiar we believe about baptism? And so that's uh, why we're at this uh, sermon today. Let's pray. Again, we bow. We've done it a couple of times already. We've sung some prayers. And this one is to say, make us ready to meditate on your word, that it might be a living word to each and every one of us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So there's a Lutheran and Baptist minister, and uh, they're having a bit of an argument. It's about baptism, and the Lutheran minister says, so if I get into the water up to my ankles, is that a baptism? And the Baptist minister says, no! And then the Lutheran minister just kind of to go, to, well, if I get up to my thighs, is that a baptism? And the Baptist minister says, no. So the Lutheran minister says, well, if I get up to my chest, is that a baptism? And the Baptist minister is looking at him wild-eyed, says, no. He says, well, if I get in up to my eyebrows, is that a baptism? And this time, just apoplectic, the Baptist minister says, no, you've got to get the water on the top of the head. And the Lutheran minister said, see, we believe the same thing. It's a baptism if water is on the top of the head. One sprinkled, the other immersed, and that's how you got the water on the top of the head. And we have uh, such little uh, differences in the Christian family. They're not all that significant, but they are different. And we have questions about those differences. We have questions like godparents, yes or no. We have questions like baptism, rebaptism. can you do that? We have questions about, oh, the biggie is infant baptism versus what we call believer's baptism, right? So we have lots of questions about baptism, and we're going to try to uh, address those. We won't do it all today, but we'll address those questions. But I wanted to start with doing a little hopscotch kind of jump through the Bible and say, here we have in Genesis, right, Noah and a flood of judgment. So everything is decimated because of evil and God thinking we gotta have a way to get a new start by eliminating this evil. And if they enter the craft that I've engineered, the ark, uh, then people who trust me can have that salvific effect of getting through the judgment waters. And then speaking of waters, we have Moses. This is on the front of your cover, the header. It says that he was drawn out of the water, Moses. Remember, as a little boy, he, he was unquestionably going to be murdered because that was the program at that time to suppress the slaves of the Hebrews. And so to save him, he was put into the water, saved by being put into the water from death that was pursuing him. And then he was drawn out by Pharaoh's daughter and became a leader a rescuer for God and the Hebrew people. 
Speaking of that, when he did lead them out of Egypt, they left Egypt, the slave house of Egypt, but they had to pass through the waters of the Red Sea. And those uh, uh, walls of water collapsed on the companies of Pharaoh's armies. And uh, they were then able to emerge on the other side, a different location, a different uh, elevation, a different identity. Uh, on the other side, they were slaves. On this side, they're bound for Beulah land. Uh, they, they put bumper stickers on their camels that say something like, you know, promised land or bust, right? <laughs> so they're, they're in a different, different place. And uh, we have promises in Ezekiel about being sprinkled clean. We have the, the water restoring the desert. But then when we come to the New Testament and quickly go through it, we find that uh, Jesus identifies with humanity by joining in John the Baptist's baptism of repentance in preparation for the Messiah and allegiance to the Messiah's kingdom. At that point, we have this trifecta of God saying, this is my son, just as the Holy Spirit descends on him and he's entering the water. So his identity becomes spirit-filled, commissioned. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased as he's in the water. Then we have um, our acts. Uh, Luke writes Acts, and he's telling the history of the early church, all these new believers. And uh, one of the groups is the Samaritans. And uh, he finds that they're filled with the Holy Spirit, but they haven't been baptized. He says, whoa, we've got to get these two together. Water and spirit filling, you know, they, we, it should be like two sides of one coin. So uh, kind of doing a little uh, Texas two-step, he gets them lined up. And then two chapters later, we have the opposite. We have Cornelius, who's been baptized but hasn't been filled with the Spirit. And again, the apostle says, we got to get these together. Water and Spirit go together. And so he baptizes him with the Holy Spirit there. And then we talk about Paul. And Paul doesn't... Paul's language is in Christ, if you're in Christ. And if you want to, think about being with Noah in the ark, and Christ is the ark. It's a, a cross-shaped vessel, if you will. Uh, when he does talk about baptism, he talks about it in terms of the covenant, the covenant God made with the Hebrew people. And that's a, a pledge, one to the other. And there's a sign of the pledge. And uh, one of the signs is circumcision. So he says, this is kind of a, a sign of the clan of faith. Uh, you don't have to physically get circumcised anymore, but there is a sign of belonging to the covenant family, and that's baptism. Uh, Peter, Peter does talk about baptism. He bypasses the Red Sea, though, and talks about it in terms of Noah and the flood and being rescued through the vessel who I've been telling you is Christ. And then if we circle back, we have that Last Supper where Jesus talks about foot washing and I'm saying that's a kind of baptism. These are Jesus's closing marching orders for his people. And then we have that final ascended, resurrected Jesus saying, as you go, make disciples baptizing them in the triune reality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. So all of that is brief, but it gives us something about baptism. And it, it comes down to what I said before. It's a, a change of identity. You go in one way and you come out another. And with that, there are, are five words that I think communicate that. And the first, the first word is renounce. And I, I have a verse here from Romans uh, that I want you to see. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? That's a renunciation of life. Uh, we were buried with him through baptism into his death. So we're dying to something in baptism. The early church, when they had 
people to be baptized, they met in the pre-dawn, dawn hours. And they would have them turn and face the west where the darkness was. And they would ask them publicly to say an answer to this question, do you renounce evil? And they would say, I or we renounce evil. And then they would turn and face the east where the sun was rising. So uh, baptism always in some form has to do with renunciation. Uh, let's say that together, just the word renounce. One, two, three, renounce. Okay. Uh, the second word is confess. And uh, here's another verse that has to do with confession. Here's another verse that has to do with confession. <laughs> If you believe in your heart and confess with your lips, you will be saved. And this is a, a believe in your heart is right here, and a confess with your lips is out here. And it's not one or the other. It's not believe in your heart, but don't confess with your lips, or confess with your lips, but don't believe in your heart. It's a, a both and. And when they turned, they renounced evil, but then they were facing the east where the sun was rising, and they were asked the question, do you affirm your reliance on God's grace? And that's a confession. I do. I rely on God's grace. So this is uh, inward and outward, the two together, not one or the other. And it's um, personal, but also public. Now, let me just ask you, if, if if you have a, a guy and a gal, they love each other, and the guy says, yeah, let's, let's be committed to each other, but I don't want the marriage thing, I don't want the certificate, I don't want the ceremony, and I don't want rings, and I'd like you yes, let's just keep this on the QT. Don't, we don't need to mention this to anybody. Would you think something fishy is going on? Yeah. Well, just so, we forsake all others, and we cleave to Christ. Or if you want to put it this way, another verse is, what shall we do? The first saved people said, what shall we do? And he says, well, repent and be baptized. Repent and be, and repent is to turn yourself around. Renounce, confess. And that's what you're doing in the be baptized. One of the books I was reading for this trip, The Wind, A Wind in the House of Islam, uh, is trying to survey what the growth of the church has been among Muslims around the world. And they wanted to know, well, how do we know if they're really followers of Jesus? And there are 16 things you could talk about on that. It, it's uh, kind of awkward, but necessary. But you know one of the key things for them to be tallied as a convert? They've been baptized. And this is very serious for Muslims because they realize they go from being fans of Jesus, is the way the book put it, to being followers of Jesus. The difference between being in love and being married is a couple of things. The difference between being a fan and a follower is a baptism thing. So we have uh, two words, uh, renounce and confess. Let's say that word together, one, two, three, confess. Baptism always involves confession. Then uh, the third word is enfold. And uh, there's a verse for that from Paul. There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And that body is the body of Christ. That's a, a way of talking about the church. And a body is not the same thing as body parts, and body parts aren't the same thing as a body. If you have a hand over here and an eyeball over here, they're just parts. They have to be enfolded <laughs> into the body to be a part of the body. And baptism has to do with enfolding. When they turn from saying, I affirm God's grace, you know the next move they made? They went inside the church. Because you entered the church by making the renunciation, the confession, and then you were enfolded through baptism entering the church. 
How many of you have been to mainly places in Europe where this font was at the entry place of the church? A few of you have. It's very, very appropriate because the way you become a member of the church is through baptism. So you enter the church through baptism. And uh, at Fitzwilliam College in Cambridge, there's a wonderful chapel there where when you enter, uh, you see the bottom of a boat above you, that's the ceiling. And then you walk up a staircase and you sit in the sanctuary inside of the pews in a boat. So uh, you pass through the waters, waters like the flood waters, and you enter the boat of Christ and you're in a ship and there's a, there are other fellows in that ship. That's why they call it a fellowship, the church, and why we worship and we have stewardship. It's all about a ship, right? Uh, so uh, we're enfolded. And, and when the, we, we come in, we come in, uh, I said the other week, you know, the guy is crazy who says, I want to play in the NFL, I just don't want to be on a team. Well, that's not possible. You can't be a Lone Ranger Christian. And you can't say, well, I was born, but I don't have a family. You may have a limited family, a fragmented family, a, a terrible family, a dysfunctional family, but you had a mother and father, and you had some semblance of a family that at least nurtured you and got you going anyway. But all of us, biologically born, become spiritually born into a family, and we're enfolded into that family. We need the family. So baptism says, I need the family. I, I'm being enfolded into the family. So uh, that's our, our fourth word, and I want us to say it together on the count of three, enfold. One, two, three, enfold. enfold. So baptism thus far means those things, including enfolding. The last word is promise. No. The last one, the next to the last word is intend, intend. And uh, uh, here's, a, uh, Paul talks about uh, putting on and putting off. Do I have a verse? Yeah. All of you who were baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, if you don't intend to put your clothes on, you're gonna show up naked someplace, and that's a terrible nightmare to have. Uh, not an uncommon one, but you, you there, you deliberately put on clothes. You just don't find yourself dressed. And in the same way, you intend to be dressed with Christ, to have the dirt washed off and to be clothed in Him. Uh, that's expressed in the intention. When they learned the Apostles' Creed, this is what we know about the Apostles' Creed, that it was first formulated for baptismal converts. And they would recite it. So they went into the church and they would recite this. And it, it really defined, because just like if you say, I, I'm in the NFL, I don't want to be on a team. But if you were on a team, you said, you guys have the pigskin, but I want to play soccer. That would be nonsensical. So when you enter the church, you enter into a common set of values and beliefs that are expressed in the Apostles' Creed. And if you have troubled yourself to learn the Apostles' Creed, it shows you have an intention, not just to be a convert, but to be a follower, not to be just a convert, but a disciple. And that shows intention. Look, if I drop my kid off at college, and as he got out, there were other kids on the sidewalk, and they said, I don't intend to go to class, I don't intend to take tests, I don't intend to see the inside of a classroom. I don't intend to go to the library. You would think something's wrong, right? And just so we have to, when we go into baptism, we're saying, I intend to be a follower. Let's say that word together, two, intend. One, two, three, intend. Okay. Now, the last word is promise. And here's a verse for promise from Ezekiel. God will sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean from all your unrighteousness. I will put my spirit within you. That's the promise of God. And around baptism, there's all sorts of promise making. 
And if you're dedicating or baptizing a, a child, you're promising before God and to the congregation that you'll raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And the church is making a promise to the family saying, and we'll be there as an extended family of faith to teach Sunday school and whatnot. And then there, there are promises, if there's godparents, there's promises about godparents. Um, and then there's of course uh, the person saying, well, I promise to be a follower. I, that intention, I'm gonna promise it and articulate it that way. But I want to change the word from promise to receive, receive the promise, because the real promise maker is God. How does the verse go? We love because he first loved us. We promise because he first promised to us. We intend because he first intended for us. We renounce because he first renounced for us. We confess because he first confessed for us. It's about receiving the promise of God that through Jesus Christ because you've asked you will be saved from the floodwaters of judgment and cleansed from all unrighteousness and hydrated into a kingdom of God kind of life wow let's say that word receive <laughs> One, two, three, receive. And we're talking about receiving the promises of God. So those five words are involved in baptism. However you split hairs about it, those five are communicated in the baptismal experience. The, uh, I don't even know how I was going to say the best baptism. I don't know if I should rate it that way. But it was certainly a wild baptism. I was in India. And it was a little village, and the little church was going to baptize. And they had a little parade through that village. And they had, like, tambourines, and all the Hindu neighbors were out just forming kind of a, a parade route gauntlet. And uh, they were mesmerized and uh, curious. And we ended up at the equivalent of an irrigation ditch on the side of town, kind of brown water, not a pretty lake or pool or anything like that. And the pastor took them down into the water and said, do you know what you're doing? Do you realize that uh, because you're a Christian, you may never find a Christian wife to marry or a Christian husband to marry. You may end up being single. You know, in parts of the world, that's a big, hairy deal. Uh, or, or do you realize that because of following Christ, you may be denied employment. Do you realize you may be persecuted? Do you realize you may lose your life for Christ? And they nodded and said yes. And then they went down into the waters. And in those waters,